I left home because my parents uh, were not going to pay for my college because I said I wanted to be a musician. And they were like, no, 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 you're going to be doctor or you're going to be lawyer. Oh, yeah. you got, and I said, no, I, I just spent my entire life concentrating on being a musician and not, that's what I want to do now, you know. And so I left and uh, I went to work in a machine shop and severed three fingers in a punch press machine. No kidding. Yeah, that was kind of a scary thing for a keyboard player. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Level Up Cleveland. And this week we have with us another legend, a local legend. And when we say that, you know, it's always somebody special. And we're not going to let you down this week either as we bring in Mr. George Sipple. Thanks for coming down, George. Hey, thanks for having me. George is a multi, multi talented, faceted guy. Uh, he's not just involved with music. Uh, he's a professional keyboard player in a number of uh, bands. American Noise was probably the biggest band you've been in, but you've also played with uh, Eric Harmon. Yeah, that's I was another. Eric Harmon's keyboard player for three years. Yeah, and um, not to mention you also do voiceovers. You're a voiceover yeah. actor. I do that. Mm -hmm. uh, you're a photographer. I do that. You're a studio producer, engineer guy. I mean, you do all the sound stuff. You're yep. uh, very good at that. You've been, you have a huge, what other things? Did I forget? Did I leave anything out? I mean. My wife loves my cooking. <laughs> you're a great cook at home. I mean, like, seriously, I mean, it's, it's a pleasure to have you on. I really, I'm glad you came down to hang out with us. Thanks. Um, basically, what I like to do is, oh, one more thing I want to mention real quick is you're now performing with those guys. That's right. Anybody can see you locally. You're you're playing in a lot of the local areas. You can look them up. There's, you know, there's a guy that comes on now that, that goes on uh, Facebook now, and he posts a page that has all the gigs for the week, and it has all oh, the I bars did, and stuff on I there. And he's got that. it separated: West Side, East Side, and everything like that. I can't think of his name. I think it's Mosley. I'll I'll I'll, I'll put I'll post that up when I. But you, anybody can find out where everyone's playing. This guy's really doing a really good job like the of old doing scene that. Magazine. Yeah. yeah, and I know I saw you guys in there. So he's so. You can find anybody, but you, specifically, I've noticed you guys are uh, Middleburg, Strongsville is where I see you guys sometimes, kind of like around that area. But you'll you'll branch out, you'll play out. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, uh, we're we're gonna got a couple of gigs come up at Marblehead. Uh, on the other hand, we've done uh, 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 Glen Willow and uh, Brewsters on the east side, and so and you know we're gonna be at uh, um, in Medina, um, uh, Blue Heron. Oh, really? Yeah, we're going to be there next Sunday. Not this Sunday, next Sunday. Oh. Whatever. And I don't know when this gets out, out there. So That's my negative was there. You'll probably see <clears> me. I'll probably pop up for that. That'd be nice. Um, so basically what I'd like to do is, like I always do, is like we'd like to go back to the school, to the beginning. Like how, mm -hmm. how do you start off? And, and, I mean, there's a lot to get to here. I mean, there's a lot of beginnings. Like you, like when did you start this? When did you start this? When did you start this kind of thing? But still, I mean, I, I think it'll be a Fun conversation to have with you. I mean, we can go back to when I was six years old and my kindergarten teacher came came to my mother's house and said, this guy's got to get piano lessons because he plays better than I do. Oh, so you could play just immediately. It wasn't... It, it oh, was, I was four years old when I started playing the piano. No kidding. And, uh, yeah, and then uh, the, um, uh, like I said, the kindergarten teacher, she'd play the song and I'd listen and I'd go up and play it right after her. And she'd be like, get out of here, you know. So I did take piano lessons when I was a kid till uh, till I was 13 and too cool. <laughs> I didn't take it many more. Um, well, I, I went to college. I majored in music in college. So, uh, and... and um, well, are you normally from, are you originally from Cleveland? Though? Oh, yeah. I'm okay, a, so where, where, where did you where did you grow up? Uh, Seven Hills. Oh. Seven Hills, right off Rockside Road. Um, went to Ignatius. So you're so your blood you're, you're you're from here. This is this is your Cleveland guy, really. That's basically how it is, right? Um, yeah, I got my first job when I was 11 years old at Bauman's Garden Center on Rockside Road, which isn't there anymore. That's where 77 and Rockside meet. That's where that place was. And as a kid, my mother said, 
you want to buy your mic mixer, you go to work. And um, <laughs> so she got me this gig, you know, and it was a greenhouse. So, you know, you were, could be under 16 to work, you know, so you were slave labor. And, um, <laughs> but I was able to buy my mic mixer, you know. And um, I actually live four, do- four doors down from Ed Sarley. Oh. Who is now my partner in those guys. Yeah. Uh, okay. Right. Years wow. later. Wow. Wow. So, and Ed was the one who taught me to play bass. I actually used to play rhythm guitar for the original group. Jimmy Stamper was the drummer. If you remember Stamper's Bar yeah, uh, in Fairview Park. Yes. Yeah, well, that's Jimmy Stamper, and he's a great drummer. He was our drummer back when we were 12, 13 years old. And that's when we started bands. By the time I was 15, 16, I was already playing in the flats. Uh, there was a place called The Warehouse uh, in the flats, and we were doing doo-wop. Really? So you got 15-year-old kids doing, like, five-part harmony, and it freaked people out, you know. <laughs> it, it, was, uh, it was pretty cool. Um, uh, then when, when I got when I graduated, um, my senior year, you'll love this, my senior year of high school, I wore a short hair wig. Because I had hair down to here, oh. and I pinned it up, and I wore a short hair wig. And um, the year after that, they had it in the school rules that uh, you weren't allowed to wear wigs. Um, <laughs> you did this, Ignatius? Yeah. That's Brought you- me into the assistant principal's office and said, Mr. Sippel, uh, we, we need to discuss this situation. And, of course, I had the school rules memorized. <laughs> and I said, well, as you can see, my hair is a neat, in, in a neat and orderly fashion. It does not cut my, uh, touch my ears. It does not touch my collar. Thank you, Mr. Sipple. You're excused. <laughs> there, I mean, there was nothing he could do. I had it nailed. Until the next year when they just said Until no wigs. Until the next year they said no wigs. But I had graduated already. Oh, that's uh, you, you, so, you won. I left home because my parents uh, were not going to pay for my college because I said I wanted to be a musician. And they were like, no, 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 you're going to be doctor or you're going to be lawyer. Oh, yeah. And I said, no, I, I just spent my entire life concentrating on being a musician, and that, that's what I want to do now, you know. And so I left, and uh, I went to work in a machine shop and severed three fingers in a punch press machine. No kidding. Yeah, that was kind of a scary thing for a keyboard player. And... Um, uh, at that time, of course, they didn't have microsurgery. I mean, this is back in 71. So they didn't have microsurgery. They gave me a bucket to bleed in. And uh, fi- they wouldn't touch me until my parents came, even though I was 18, which was really messed up because I wasn't living at home. Um, so my parents came, and they said, well, the doctor says, well, we can either cut them off here, and you'd have a thumb and a little finger, or we can try and sew them back on. I I said, come yeah, on, yeah. give me a break. <laughs> You're yeah. going to try and sew them back on. And um, they did sew back on. There, there's, I still can't really make a fist out of it. But the cool part, <laughs> okay, there's a good side to that. Believe it or not, there, there is an up to this. All right, folks, I'll get you out of the doldrums here. Um, there is an upside. Uh, I went to college. They said, well, you're a smart kid. You know, workman's comp will pay for college. I said, cool, I can take music then. <laughs> so I went to college, majored in music as a piano major. Wow! And how are your fingers at this point? They're stiff, and they and and they 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 don't. I don't have nerves. My I drive my wife nuts because I pull things out of the oven <laughs> be, be, because I can't feel them. You know. Wow. Um, to this day, you know, I, I I haven't gotten any smarter over the years. <laughs> so that that really is. So you still have no feeling in your hand right now? No. Wow. No. Um, and, and so I, I, I play piano rather, you know, you can see, I don't even have wrinkles yeah. in, the, in the top of my hand, you know, it, it's pretty much stiff, but, um, I learned to get around it. And, um, uh, so then I was involved in a group called magic at that time, which was doing, you know, they go on Wednesday night. We were going to, uh, Thursday night, we were at the corral and Friday nights we were doing CYOs in high schools, you know? Uh, and Magic was really a very popular band because we did um, we did stuff that nobody else like we did MacArthur's Park, the full version. Uh, we did a Beach Boy medley, full harmonies. Wow! You know, w- so nobody else was doing Beatle medleys and things like that that other bands weren't doing. Well, Eric Carmen uh, was in the Raspberries at the time, and I guess he was having his issues there. 
And he, whenever he was in town, he used to come down and see us play because he enjoyed the Beach Boy stuff and, you know, the fact that we were doing different things, you know. Um, so then when Raspberries broke up, he said, would you guys be my backup band? Oh. And uh, we said, oh, no, <laughs> we don't want to do an album. <laughs> um, you know, right away, uh, we jumped into it. And uh, we rehearsed uh, the first album at his apartment. And then we got the instrumentation together. And then we flew to New York and did the album uh, all by myself being the big hit off of that. Yeah, so that you were a part of that. Yeah, yeah. Wow. What's the, Okay, just stop real quick. I'm going to stop right here because that's a, that's a song like – when I found out Eric Harmon actually wrote that song years ago and stuff, I couldn't believe that that because that's like that was like that's like one of those songs that's not just like a local hit or something. That's like one of them songs that's like insanely huge. Yeah, I, like I, I think every person on earth has at least heard yeah. that song type song, right? You know, oh, it's what almost I mean? at the point where every person on earth has recorded it, yeah, I mean, and redone it. Um, <laughs> but like, what's it like being a part of a song that turns into that? Like when you're watching that song, kind of like do its thing. I, I, I saw it on, what's that show where they wear the masks? At, uh, the Mask Singer? Oh, yeah, 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 The Mask Singer. Uh, um, uh, Archuleta sang all by myself. Last I saw it on the tape oh, last night. So there you go. And I, and I, I, my wife and I laugh because I just keep going, heard that song. You know? <laughs> um, I, I got a nice gold uh, single out of it. I got a gold album off of that. Um, toured with Eric for three years. It's It's really... I, and I, and then uh, Celine Dion came out with it. And, oh my God! When she does that key change at the end of the song, the hair on my arms just go boop. Used to be the hair on my head, but pff, yeah, it's gone. <laughs> so, um, but it's really when that key change happens, it's so different than what Eric did. It, it just killed me. I loved it. Yeah. Um, I've heard Frank Sinatra so, sing it. Yeah, that's that, that's another you know, thing. So crazy. then you get to hear all these famous people that are like you know, insanely like huge. And, do that song. I mean, like to me, you know, like for us, it's it's this podcast thing, right? And like, if I put out a really good podcast, it does really well. I, I watch the views, and I'm like, oh wow, man! Like this is, and, it, and that's where you know you 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 can watch your thing grow into what it becomes for other people. Oh, suddenly, Billboard magazine becomes your, you know, <laughs> your favorite toilet magazine. You know, it's <laughs> yeah. watching you know the thing go up. We got up to number two on that. I think I don't think it hit one. Really, uh, it did get number two. Uh, which was perfect for the toilet. Um, <laughs> I get it. So anyway, uh, yeah, uh, it, I mean, that was just really cool. I mean, we toured for three years. Unfortunately, touring was weird. When we toured with the Beach Boys for three months, that was cool because it was genre-wise. Yeah, yeah, right. It was very similar. But then when we were on the road with Sweet. Oh, no kidding. We were their opening act. You know, and they're, the people in the audience are there to hear Ballroom Blitz. Yeah, right. You know, and we're playing all by myself. And they're, they're like, fuck you! <laughs> you know? And it just it just was not, it was it was not happening. Right. You know, uh, and um, it, it, was, it was tough because you'd come off stage going. Yeah, because like Sweet is like that times heavy metal type thing oh, you yeah, know like yeah. they were like the heavy metal band at that they, point they were so funny too i mean they'd walk past us and <laughs> you know this thing. they were living the they were living the life of the whole rock thing <sighs> and the whole the glam they were kind of the glam thing at the time right too like yeah so then we uh we went to england to do eric's second album uh with gus dudgeon who was uh Elton john's producer and we did it at this, it was so cool because we did it at the Marquee Studio. First of all, there's the Marquee Club, which was kind of like the Cleveland Agora, except they had big, big stars. Right. You walked in there and you saw David Bowie in the beginning. You saw Jimi Hendrix in the beginning. You saw The Who in the beginning. You saw all the top bands played this little stinking club, you know. And the Marquee Studio was next to it, which is where Eric and Eric uh, Elton did his records. Oh. They had just finished Blue Moves. And uh, which was really a cool album, and, but all the equipment was still set up, you know. Eric's uh, Elton's piano, you know, and, and the way they used to record with a box over the grand piano and put the mics through a box, really to so capture that, the so sound of like play, well, so they could play live with the drummer and the bass player. Oh, and it not bleed so yeah. much. Oh, wow, because they were in the same room. Um, and then they had the tape up, and the guy goes, Oh, yeah, hey, hey, listen to it, you know. And, you know, you're sitting there like, 
fiddling with the things, you know. Yeah, the controls of the... How wild was that? Yeah. Now, yeah. Was, this, was this the first time you've been in a situation like that at that point? Where you're, is, this your, is this your introduction to the big control panel and all that? Or Actually, uh, yeah. The, I mean... Is that where you got the fever? Kind of like, did you... No, I had no idea. Oh, really? Uh, and, and the reality was that Ed Sarley and I, when we were 12, 13, 14 years old, he'd come over and my dad had a Grundig tape recorder. Oh. Okay, and it had something, at sound on sound. You know, which was really kind of weird back then because you had your wall and sack that had mono recording and things like this. This was a stereo recording that you, a uh, stereo machine that you could do sound on sound. So we used to do like the Beatles songs and have like brushes playing drums and then we'd play bass and guitar and do the harmonies and double track voices and things like that. Wow, Back so you were learning. We were 12 you, and 13. You didn't realize and it, but you it were was, learning it. Duh. You know, I didn't yeah. catch on. Oh, well, that's, you know, who <laughs> oh, want to do that? Um, okay, so Eric Carmen, we did that uh, second album. England just bombed. It just did not work. Came back after a month of, like, nothing. Eric went to L.A. and did the second album. Um, did it with studio guys. And then he called me and said, want to go on the road? And uh, I said, no, I'm busy. <laughs> now, with, with Hall & Oates, I don't think so. And what year would this be like? Where are we at now with Hall & Oates' oh, career? Oh, probably 1976, oh. 77. So, um, yeah, of course, I went on the road. Um, and um, unfortunately, Eric got sick. So the tour was canceled. Oh. So, um, it, 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 which was the end of my Eric Carmen career. And so all of a sudden from, yeah, know, right, from high to low, which is this business is like, that's what it does, right? It can do that in a second. So, um, you know, I was kind of like, now what am I going to do now? You know, I got a job at After Dark as the secretary receptionist. I got the legs for it. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> you could handle it. I, it. It was perfect for the job. Um, so I got a job at After Dark as, and I started watching people record Frank Amato was doing like a four track thing over there and, and, and Kirk Yano had the, the 16 track, you know, and I, um, I had just gotten divorced because my Eric Carmen situation was, I was so well behaved. <laughs> um, so then, um, I, uh, anything crazy happened, like specifically crazy happened with the Eric Harmon days that you're like, Oh, this one time, anything you can talk about, I, I should say <laughs> in Atlanta, Don Kruger was my roommate. In, on the Eric Carmen in the Eric Carmen band, the drummer, and it was, it, it was it was problems. I mean, one day we were in Atlanta, and of course we had the garb on and the, the hair and the whole bit, and there were these businessmen sitting around the swimming pool, and I said, "Hey, you want to fuck with these guys a little bit?" And he, yeah, okay. What do you want to do? Well, let's let's jump in the pool and do a lap and go up to our room, and we were fully dressed and everything, you know. Well, we didn't realize that the water was like 50 degrees. <laughs> so we jumped in the water and, and we went up to our rooms afterwards. And the two of us had just body shock. Just, <laughs> you know. Um, we, we were noted for uh, if the, if the ho hotel had a fountain, uh, we'd get up on the second floor and take uh, Dawn. You'd make bubble bath out of the fountain. <laughs> One hotel, man, the whole <laughs> lobby was just like a big bubble. It was so the, the the touring with him you learned a lot at this point. I'm sure I'm sure that tour actually was like something that you learned a lot about. Well, it was so cool. I mean, like we did Midnight Special, if you remember. That was extremely popular on Friday nights. Yeah, right. And we did the Midnight Special, and he got a chance to meet, like, you know, I, I met Robin Williams. Wow. You know, and 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 just a bunch of uh, Fonzie and, and uh, you know. Henry Winkler. Henry Winkler. Yeah, and, wow. And, and, and you meet these people, and it's like, hey, how you doing? Yeah, okay, you know. Um, I, I was at a party. Uh, this was actually later on, but I was at a, at a person's party, and I went in the kitchen to get a beer, and this guy walks in, and he grabs a beer, and, and he looks at me and goes, and I went, we sat down at the table and split joint. Didn't say one word to each other. Well, I'm looking at this guy and I'm going, I'm smoking a joint with flipping Skunk Baxter. Skunk Baxter. 
Now that's heavy duty because he's like, you know, the, the king of the Doobie Brothers and then went off and he's like some big government type person and still has solo albums and stuff and synthesizers and everything. And, and, and he walked and we, at the end when, and he walks out. Never even spoke a Never word. Never said a word. And it was just like, you know, how weird is this? You know? Well, that's the universal words of smoking one together. Smoking a tube, yeah. Yeah, man. So, uh, okay, where were we? We were Eric Carmen. So your, car- your career with Eric Carmen just ended. And, 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 and like I was saying, I, I hung around the studio, and I started engineering. Kirk was kind enough to say, hey, you know, um, Brian Sands. I did an album for Brian Sands, um, who unfortunately has passed away now. Yeah, yeah, but... Uh, it, it was on a four track, and then I went to an eight track, then I went to a 16 track, then I went to a 24 track, and before you know it, I, I was actually an engineer that people were going, you know, we'd like to work with George, you know, and um, so I, I, I was like thrilled. Unfortunately, I was still making minimum wage of the secretarial job, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. And so I said, look, we got to do something about this, blah, 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 and... Nothing ever happened, so I went over to talk to Arnie Rosenberg, who had just finished building the recording connection in Beechwood. Okay. Which was the premier studio. I mean, that that place was pfft, wonderful. Got a ju- He said, yeah. He says, uh, you want to you work? I said, sure. He says, I got a gospel section tomorrow. What? He says, I said, I don't know where the mics are. I don't, Come on. I'll show you where the mics are. I'll show you where the chords are. I'll show you. Where the well, the gospel people love me. No kid. And so oh, that's cool. he said, man, he said, yeah, I'll be glad to use you as a freelancer. And I said, okay. So on Monday, I did that on Sunday. And then Monday I went back to After Dark. And all the doors were strangely, the locks had been changed. Oh. Yes. So um, I had to make a decision that I was going to be working at the recording connection. And I ended up working there uh, until it went belly up. And then EDR Corporation took over. They bought it. And... Um, I became chief engineer, and I, I got, oh, God, I, I got a chance to record all the, uh, like, you know, uh, 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 Rich Spina's, you know, the love affair, and the, yeah. the um, uh, un, I think it's Unknown Stranger was one of his bands. Um, I got a chance to record a uh, lot of commercials. I did a lot of the, uh, the Jim Brickman stuff when he was a jingle writer, and um, uh, that was cool, and then... Um, I got a job doing the NBC Source radio show, uh, which what that was was every month they come in with two twenty four tracks. We'd lock them up, and they put a two ta- two track on, and go. We're going to give you twenty minutes to learn the tracks, and we do it live, and we go. And so I'm doing these like Stray Cats, The Pretenders, uh, 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 Golden Earring. Uh, I mean, just all these like bands that were really popular in the eighties and I'm doing these live shows, you know, live. And I had no video monitor to go, Oh, he's going into a solo. It's oh, this guy. Oh, you were just all, everything was just through the headphones. Basically? It was just like right there, you know? Wow. Um, and that was cool. I did that for quite some time for them. That had to sharpen um, your senses doing this kind of thing too, something like that, where you really had to be like so in tune. You had to be ready, like, and you yeah. had to have a you had to have a pretty reasonable mix so that even though a guitar solo would start, normally a guitar player kicks it anyway. Right. So you did, you know, uh, Stray Cats. Oh my gosh, to to solo up his guitar tracks was like religion. I mean, it was like this guy didn't make a mistake, and he was like hot. He still is. Yeah. Know? Right. Um, Brian Setzer. Um, so, uh, the, and then, um, one day a client came in and said, you're, you're one of those musician guys. I said, yeah, I am <laughs> one of those musician guys. And they said, well, I have this show and I need music. Can you write it? Sure. <laughs> I had never done it before, but right. the old, the old thing, the thing is anytime anyone asks you something like this, the answer is always yes. And then you'll figure it out. Then you'll figure it out. <laughs> right. But I ended up writing the music for the show. Okay, and it ended up being pretty good. Um, now, how do you go about? What was your what was your you know plan of attack for something like this when you you've never really done it before? How did you go about? What was your like thinking at, at that point? Do you remember? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, well, well, it was funny because um, I used I had an emulator two, which was a sampler amp uh, unit 
that would read time code. So I would stripe the t- the video had time code, and I would start recording it not onto the tape but into the unit. So that's how I kind of put things together. And then um, I had M- Andy Kubachevsky on drums. A uh, little background: Andy Kubachevsky was the guitar player for um, the Exotic Birds, uh, which was a popular band at that time, uh, which Trent Reznor played in. For a while, so I knew Trent from that uh, stuff. So, and Andy right now is in Los Angeles, and he writes for television shows. You know, all the music that you get behind television. So it's just like all the score for the television, yeah, as you would yeah. say. So anyway, so going on, I I, I did that, and, and before you knew it, somebody said, "Well, why don't you write a jingle for this?" And my first jingle was for Joe Ferment Chevrolet. Uh, I had Jennifer Lee come in and sing the jingle. And it went pretty well, you know. And then, um, I don't know, I just, I kept getting busier and busier. I was doing, um, I, I, I was doing satellite things where uh, Ford wanted me to redo Have You Driven a Ford Lately? Except the singers were in Detroit. And they didn't want to come to Cleveland because they were busy. So it was like, okay, how do I do this now? Well, we had a stereo uh, 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 digital disc and so I sent them the music track on one channel and then a time code track on the other and sent that to them so they heard the music track and then they'd send me via stereo the voice track and the time code track and then I'd lock that to my machine so that I had all and I would just do in multiple takes of the and say okay I like this one I like this one but you know you were ahead of your time basically at this point because about six months later um, uh, Michael Jackson came out with his big coast to coast recording session. I'm sitting there going, hold my beer, you know, come <laughs> on. I did that, done that, wore the t-shirt. Yeah. yeah. Right, right, right. Um, so I really got involved in some technology and things like that. And, um, I wasn't playing in bands at all. Uh, I, I had no interest at that point because, um, just, as I went, to, and, and this is an important story, as I went to Beachwood or just before when I was working After Dark, um, I was in Breathless. I left Breathless to join a group called American Noise. <clears throat> and um, it started out with a four-track machine. And, you know, can you play some keyboard parts on this? You know, and I said, well, yeah, sure. You know, so I wrote the keyboards and stuff like that. And before you know it, it became a band. Um, and And... The cool part about American Noise was that, A, they were seasoned musicians. You know, I mean, these, and the focus on it, we were going to get a record contract. We're going to make an album. That's it. We're not going to be a local band, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And so that to this day, people who saw American Noise were like, they were just so hot, so tight, so, you know. And it was a great band, and then we went to L.A. and we recorded the record, and and uh, it's still a great album. I think it still holds up. Um, but got no support from the record company, so and thanks to John Gorman, I mean, it got a lot of airplay on MMS, yeah. you know. And but um, unfortunately, then we lost the contract, and. Um, I just, I was so frustrated. I left the band. I said, you know, I don't want to play the local clubs anymore. I mean, I'm, I'm done with this stuff. Right. You know? And that's when I went to uh, uh, Recording Connection, which became Beachwood. So I was at Beachwood for 13 years. And, wow. Oh, uh, okay. It, it, was, it was a great experience because it was, it was one of those things. Can you do this? Sure. How are we going to do this? You know, <laughs> right, always say it, yes. it was an existence of, of daily, you know, of, of that kind of questioning and answering. And I was recording rock bands, and 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 then I got in more into advertising and and commercial production and things like that. Um, then um, I just started getting frustrated because I was getting no support from. I was middle management, Yahoo. Gotcha. I was responsible to this guy and responsible to these people, you know, to make them money. And uh, it wasn't happening and because I wasn't getting any support. And so I, I uh, left the company. I, I, I talked to my wife, and I said, Jesus, Jan. Uh, she says, you've always wanted to do your own thing. And I said, you mean like 
make my own studio? She says, yeah, do a home studio. Now, this is in 1986. Yeah, that's expensive. Nobody did home studios. Talking a lot of money to build time. something like this. But because I was, I was not interested in doing bands, I was just interested in continuing the corporate work, which basically I needed a voice booth. Uh, I needed a board. I needed a video machine. I needed a time code DAC player. So I knew exactly. I had figured out a way. Oh, God. If you remember, we, that VHS, was, what was it called? VHS Hi-Fi was like almost a digital audio. So what I did was I used to have the video people, when they made me a VHS, they'd put the, t the, the, uh, the sync audio on one track and time code on the other. And because it was semi-digital, it wouldn't bleed. So then I take that time code and put it into an eight track Roland that, that, that accepted time code. I'm getting too specific here. Yeah, but, it, but, it, it, but I see Pat taking notes over there. <laughs> and <laughs> that, <laughs> and, and that allowed me to actually do post a picture in this little studio, you know, and I did it in my house. So I had no overhead, you know, I mean, it, it was a $50,000 investment. Wow. Right off the bat. Wow. Uh, I still have one mic in my studio, and that's for, like, if a guitar player comes in or so, a vocal, I'm, whatever, you know. I have one mic, and I'm, st I'm still doing, uh, I'm doing a project right, right now as we speak for Church's Chicken. Uh, my clients are Church's Chicken, uh, Cleveland Clinic, uh, Sherwin-Williams, uh, uh, um, Aspen Dental, and what are you uh, doing exactly? Church. You're coming up with jingles for them? You're no, coming up with what? No, what, what are you internal corporate stuff. They have what we don't realize in this, in this world is the fact that there's this large amount of corporate meeting stuff where they have these large meetings. And that's what I'm doing for churches right now is, is oh. as simple as recording the guy who says, Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Joe Schmo, oh. our corporate CEO, blah, 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 chief cook and bottle washer. Boom. And then music comes on and he walks on. And, you know, that kind of stuff has to be done. Wow. And so it's as simple as that. But you do about 60 of those and you've made some money. Yeah, I can see. And and, and, and one, doing one of them, it's not like recording a whole song where you got mixing and all that stuff. You just do your vocal part? And and, yeah, and so there, there's that part of it. Then there's videos, you know, the, the big corporate videos. You know, this is our latest schmutz, you know, that we're, we're selling, and that has to have some kind of background, you know, sound effects. Now, when, so, you're doing, when you say you're doing these, you're not just recording them. Are you the voice? Sometimes. So, so you just decide what's right for this certain thing or whatever, and you, you match that. Well, yeah, I, I have to go through chains of like, yes, I approve of this. Yes, I approve. I got oh, you. no. And then it comes back. <laughs> really? That's how it works, huh? Oh, yeah. yeah. A lot of people. Yeah, I have, a, I have two messages in my, on my mailbox right now that I have to go change things. Somebody didn't like uh, this and that. You know? Now, at this point, have you already started doing jingles, though, for, for people? Is, have you gotten to that point yet? <sighs> my first jingle... In 1986, that I wrote was this ridiculous thing called the IX Indoor Amusement. Park. That's the first one. No, kidding. that I wrote on my own in my own studio, and um, the influence, the, the the concept came from Fine Young Cannibals. She drives me crazy. I don't know if you remember. <laughs> oh that yeah, thing. she drives me crazy. crazy. Yep, that's where I got the. And people go, "What? How did you do?" But if you listen to that. Uh, Dum, dum. That's what the guitar rhythm was on that song. Oh, well, well, then you just yeah. go da dum, da dum, dum. Suddenly, that's the IX Indoor Amusement Park, you know. So that's where I got the rhythmic structure of that song. And why do you think that happened? It was just song was in your head at this point in time, and it just you couldn't get it out of your head. And you're like, well, yeah. It, I mean, the the object of the game is to create an earworm. You know what I mean? Something that's going to go and stay there. You know, and so. Uh, my concept in writing jingles, and I, I, I've, I've mentioned this before it, it, in other interviews, is the fact that I try to stay simple in my melody lines so that it really becomes uh, very easy to memorize. I X indoor amusement park, three notes. 
You know? I got you. I got you. Okay. So. This is what I wanted to know, too. This stuff right so here. So cool. So fun. What a great place to meet someone. Yeah. Three notes. Back and okay. forth. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, right. Exactly. And, and then, that's that's the key. And a clever lyric, something that catches you. And then, uh, you know, you get somebody great like Billy Sullivan to sing it. And God bless him, he did a bang-up job. Yeah. To this day, he plays it out on gigs, which is <laughs> hysterical. He'll go into a gig and people go, God, I X, you know. Um, and Ed Sarley, my partner, who keeps... Stepping into my life <laughs> from those guys, uh, he played guitar on that. Uh, the drums was was a drum machine thing, and 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 I played some keyboards behind it. Yeah, and um, that's that's was so that started your that started it all off for you. And the in, fact in that my you, home studio, yes, that and correct. and and you had some success with this. So it's like now after that, yeah, yeah. I mean, I I was doing jingles and I was doing the corporate thing. Um. I was doing some MIDI arranging for people. Um, uh, I still do it like for a, a Billy March. I don't know if you know Billy. Uh, 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 I, I actually like will create the songs now. He'll give me the song and uh, I'll do the arrangement. So I do a lot of arrangement work. Um, for a number of years now, Eddie Tomeco and I uh, were putting out Christmas albums. And the money was going to uh, uh, Akron Children's Hospital. Oh, great. And so what it was was local talent. Everything was free. And I got to do, you know, do string charts and all kinds of things like that. So, yeah, I, I, I'm still, you know, I was involved in that. And so um, a, as time went on, uh, Craig Balzer passed. He had cancer. He's the lead singer, main writer for, for American Noise. And... Uh, it, it, it just kind of, I, I said, oh, I, I'm wasting a part of my talent, you know? And, and, and I, I, I didn't feel right about that. So a friend of mine, Jerry Zygo, was playing for um, a group called, I believe they were called Dr. Mo. Well, Mo is Monica Robbins. Oh. And so I, I said, I know you don't have a keyboard player. Can I come and play for free? I just got to get out and play. I just, I got to do this. And he said, well, I, I don't know. I, you'd have to talk to Monica. It's her band. And so I called Monica, and she didn't know me, and I didn't know her. And um, first of all, probably one of the most wonderful people in the world. She's just a, a great person. And she said, sure, sure, <laughs> really? come on down, and let's play. And she was like, this dude can play, you know? So... I was in the whiskey cast. Yeah, you're in now. Uh, yeah, I'm in. Uh, I did that for a while. Um, and then I said, well, Ed and I are getting up there in age. Maybe we should do something together. And hence, uh, about four or five years ago, uh, the inception of those guys, uh, which was once again sticking part of your body out. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, the... Um, because those guys uses backing tracks. And so any bass player and drummer in town hates us. <laughs> <laughs> you take their yeah. job away. Uh, yeah. you know. <laughs> but the thing is, uh, uh, you know, and we do use backing tracks. And we're, we're, it's funny, it's taken us four years, but now we're doing things like Toto and Chicago, and stuff with horns. I mean, we just, let's use them. <laughs> if we got them, <laughs> damn it, we're going to use them. You and know? Are you doing all this in your studio, setting all these Put, up? Putting this stuff together, getting levels. Um, if, if, if I got a karaoke track or something, and you know, and, and I could change levels and stuff. Um, and so I put, the, I put the tracks together, and then uh, sometimes, like we do a Michael Stanley song, well, obviously we had to create the whole track. Uh, we did, uh, we're doing Still the One. Still no one, you know, but the, the trouble is it's so high, we had to bring it down to a point where all the harmonies had to be redone. Oh. So I sat down in the studio and I sang all the harmonies, you know, and uh, so there's a lot of that sort of thing. Uh, we do um, uh, the Africa by Toto. Well, the thing is, it's, it's got that sweet, um, you know, a real intense kind of vocal, you know, which if one person's singing live, it's like... So what we did was we double-tracked it so that when I'm singing live, 
I have my double track singing with me. Oh. So all of a sudden there's this really nice thick sound. And and so the concept is damn it, I want to entertain people. You right. know? Yeah. That's the whole focus of this thing. I, I don't care how we do it, because people don't care I have backing tracks. They oh god, this is good. Sounds like a band. You yeah, know? right. And, and well, it's really you guys doing the stuff. It's not like you're just cases. pumping it through. Uh, uh... Sometimes we do a karaoke. Okay. Don't, don't misunderstand me. Um, I can't take credit for all the backing tracks. Some of them are just like, oh, this is a karaoke. <laughs> you know, right. take the guitars out and take the keyboards out. And... No, I understand. Okay, so, um, but the cool part is we we bought a Bowie system, and the nice part about that is. You got one level. There is no amps. There's nothing else. Everything goes through the bow system. You want me to turn down? Okay. You want me to turn up? Okay. No kidding. So that changes the game, huh? Oh, it makes it so much easier. With a drummer, it's it's hard to do that. Hey, keep it down. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know. Well, but like I said, though, a lot of the stuff is you, and and so the bottom line is, is every time you guys go to add a new song to your set list, or if you want to do something like that, you got a trip to the studio and you got to create all this yes. stuff, and oh, every yeah. time it's a new, it's a new process. Yeah, and, and Ed and I, who are seasoned uh, studio people, yeah, you know, for us playing along with tracks, that's the other thing. People think, oh, it's so easy to play with tracks. Oh, really? Yeah. You make one little mistake, or you lose where you are in the song. You're gone. Yeah, because there's no forgiveness. It, it, that, that guy does not wait for you. Or, <laughs> yeah, you know, right. If you feel like jamming a solo, uh-uh, the band ain't waiting for you, you know? Yeah, you, right. You get your solo, you're out of there, you know? Um, so there is a certain amount of difficulty. Uh, we do um, uh, John Cougar Mellencamp. Um, da, da, Jack and Diane. Jack and Diane. Well, in one part of the song, it gets real quiet, and the only thing holding the song together is a, is a tambourine. Oh, that's keeping and the tempo have, and everything. And we going. have to follow that tambourine. And it's so funny because you kind of see the two of us go. Your ears? You're, you're trying to, like, hear it? Hear it, you know, make, <laughs> because it's, it, a tambourine isn't like, you know, a snare drum. And we all, it's, it's kind of funny. We always have to. You know, kind of. Oh, You're leaning into it without you know, trying to be obvious. Your, hold your breath here. We are, because we have lost it a few times. You know, and, yeah. uh, we're uh, the it gets. You know, you're you're playing guitar or li- playing your keyboard part, and and it's like, oh God, I'm ahead of this beat now. How do I pull back? Or how do I get back into it? So I mean, the, the it does have its downfalls. You know, it's it's problem tillering. You know. Oh yeah, it's not it's not perfect. Just like the looper thing. You know, these guys that are doing the looper things, mm. that everyone acts like, oh, you know, it's very difficult to do that looper thing and get it get it right. You real know what I mean? real quick, the king of looper is Alex Bevan. Yeah, I mean, he do, he has it down. He plays. I don't even hear it click. I don't hear nothing. All of a sudden, he's doing a solo, and I'm hearing the chords in the background. I'm going. What? Where did that come? <laughs> That's cool. And, and uh, but I'm just saying, it takes it, it. It's a learning process, also that that whole that whole looper All thing. That it's, it's a lot tougher. Modern than. technology. Yeah. You know? All right, we're gonna take a quick break. When we come back, I want to talk about. Um, you want some Emmys? I want. I want to talk about the Emmys that you want. I want to talk about uh, some of the voiceover stuff that you've done. I want to talk about you know just some other things in, that I want to touch on. Sure. When, when we come back uh, with George Sipple, a couple minutes. So cool, so fun. It's so cool and so fun. And if this song sounds familiar, you're not the only one. Because this jingle has been getting stuck in the heads of Northeast Ohioans for nearly a quarter of a century. What a thrill, you know, to turn on the radio and go, oh my God, it's that song again. George Sipple's the man behind the song, a former rock musician turned audio engineer turned jingle writer. The IX Indoor Amusement Park tune, actually George's first big project in the business. Talk about starting off with a bang. It was only intended to be used one year, and they've been using it every year ever since. Billy Sullivan is the voice behind the tune, and the other half of the dynamic duo responsible for Cleveland's favorite earworm. So where did it come from? At that particular time, there was a song that was very popular uh, called She Drives Me Crazy by Fine Young Cam. And th- that hook, she drives me crazy, it used to go through my head all the time. Short bursts of guitar, da 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 So I grabbed that idea. It should be kind of rock, it should be up-tempo. It's supposed to be the teen version. So I kind of took that direction and we did a few takes and, uh, that, and the rest is history. As popular as it is in Cleveland, 
The tune actually isn't Georgia's best known work. For the best car insurance rates in town, call 1-800-GENERAL-NOW. Kind of tops it out because that's a national. So cool, so fun. What a great place to meet someone. But it is one of his favorites. A song written and recorded 24 years ago that is still just as catchy today. I think people still like it. They love to hate it. Oh, I hate that thing. I can't get it. I hear it once and I get, you know. Thank you. I appreciate that. go right away to the IX Indoor Amusement Park. Gonna get to the IX Indoor Amusement Park. And we are back, everybody, with Mr. George Sippel. And we have discussed a lot about the, the music career and his recording career and stuff like that. And he's got a lot of other careers that he's involved in. One of them. Which, which rear did you want to talk about now? <laughs> the rear? Yeah. The, well, the car rear? Yeah. <laughs> no, but you, you, you've mentioned that you won three Emmys. Yeah. Yeah. They were local Emmys, but they're still... And, you know, I, count. Got the, I got the statue with the guy holding the gold globe and yeah yeah yeah, yeah 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 so what were those for how did what, what, how did that happen they they were just um two were television shows and one was an advertisement on oh. television oh, oh. and um they you know it, it, it's surprising a lot of times and and I think with two of the Emmys it was just kind of a surprise that Somebody thought it was worth something. I just thought I was doing my job. I, I wasn't trying to like get accolades or recognition. Yeah, I was doing my gig, and all of a sudden somebody called up and said, "You know, come to the Emmys." And uh, quick Emmy story: uh, it was the first one, and they invite you. You know, they say, "Oh, please come." You know, you're up for an Emmy award. You know, you don't know that you're going to get it, but right, right, you know, right. it's kind of cool to be invited. And Jan and I were were a little. You know, giddy at the time about well, the whole thing, you know, maybe. Well, we're gonna sit in the back. So we're like, <laughs> oh, you know, we, we're shy. <laughs> I understand. Know? Yeah. So we're sitting in the back, and um, Michael Stanley um, was doing his afternoon exchange or some. After he had an afternoon, yeah, television on the on show, TV, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, with um, oh, I can't think of the young lady's name. Anyway, uh, they were all, you know front row, of course. You know, they were the hot shots at that time. Michael Stanley was always a hot shot in my book, but right. uh, he, he, he was there that night. Well, then when they got to, uh, let's see, this Emmy, and I'm not sure even which one it was at that time, but they said George Sippel, composer of music for blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, Really? This is cool. Yeah. So I walked up and, and, you know, I didn't, I didn't even try to fake that I had a piece of paper or something because I, I just never thought, you know, I was going up there and I, thank you everybody. And, 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 and that's really great. And I'm surprised at uh, the recognition and, you know, just made a little bit of a small speech. I said, thank you. And walked back all the way back to the thing. And so the show continues and all of a sudden Michael stands up. Okay. Now, you know, when Michael Stanley stands up, everybody's like, uh oh yeah right. Where's he going? Is he going to get a drink? Is he going to the bathroom? You know where is he going? And Michael stands up, casually walks all the way back and all the way around, and comes up to me. And of course everybody's like, "Who are these guys? What is this?" You know. Uh, uh, and he goes, in in his Michael Stanley way, man. He says, "This it's good to have a rocker make it like this. Good to have you on board, man. Thanks a lot. It was great." And wow. That was probably one of the earliest experiences I'd had with Michael. And then he walks back and it was just like, this guy's pretty cool. Oh, yeah. He thought, he thought enough of it to, 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 to just, get up. just for that reason. I mean, he's in the front, so everybody sees what he's doing and he comes back to me and th th that, to me, that was my first impression of him. And I really got it. And, and years later, I engineered for him, and, and you know, warmed up acts and stuff. So, so I, I I got to know him over the years, and um, uh, he was really a pretty upstanding guy, you know. But anyway, going back to the Emmys, so that was uh, uh, two of them. One was uh, on a, like a morning exchange or something, and it was just a thing about how to make a rock and roll record. Really? And they came in the studio and, you know, I showed them s some stuff and, you know, uh, showed them how pieces, parts get put together. And so it was just like a segment of, the, of of morning exchange. Yeah. And then 
I won an Emmy for that. Wow. But, but That's cool. I didn't do anything. You know, big deal. And then I, uh, there was a spot for a TV announcer. You know how they have the, you know, uh, this week on Joe Schmo. Oh, yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I just did this thing with all this audio and sound effects and everything like that. Didn't think anything of it. Was like, get out of here, really, you know. And then the third one was for a television show called Finding Aliza. And what it was was um, uh, a story about a woman in the concentration camps who had a friend, Aliza, who the two of them bonded in the camps and then never saw each other again. They And turns out years later, they, run they, into they each got other. into they made contact. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, here's all these. Is this like the Ed Sarley story? No, no. Oh. no. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, kind of. I um, understand. I just kidding. So, but here's all these concentration camp videos and things like that. I went, oh, wow. And I had like three days to write the whole show, which was it was a, I think it was a half hour show, and it was music front to back. And so I just, I just began to vomit music. I mean, but it had to be emotional. So what I did was I decided on instrumentation. I did piano, cello, and oboe because those three are kind of mournful type sounds. And so I wrote this thing and um, I won an Emmy for it. It was just really cool. Um, years later, I took the concept of that and I rewrote it for the Cleveland Clinic. If you go on Cleveland Clinic um, or YouTube and you look up Cleveland Clinic um, Empathy, there's this thing where there's no vocal at all, no narration, no anything, except this music. And what it's about is when you see somebody, you should be empathetic because you don't know what's going on in their life. And it's really a touching video. Um, it's got, uh, last count, it was over 6 million views. Wow. On YouTube. And uh, it's really it, it, it's really a good thing to kind of like, uh, I, I mean, people comment, like, you know, uh, just the fact that it's just a video with music. And uh, I felt very proud to be a part of that scene. Um, so you that said, won me a cans, uh, really? Uh, yeah, uh, a cans. What they call a corporate award or something. Uh, I have a nice plaque on my. Do wall. you go to cans for this? Does, did uh, you get to do that? Oh, that would have been. Cool. I had to pay for the award. Come on! Oh wow! <laughs> you know, <laughs> but it's cool. You know, um, yeah. It, but it's, it's so it, you know you are appreciated for for stuff. Well, it's good know. to be noticed that you're you're not doing this and it's just going into do a wall and no one's ever like getting to hear any. You're finding out that it's heard and appreciated. The the other cool thing was my niece who lives in Vancouver, uh, worked work for a company, and I guess a lot of people use this video as an inspiration thing. No kidding. So a lot of corporate places were playing them in corporate meetings just to, to, to kind of inspire people. And she was at a meeting, and this thing's playing. And the end of it came up and said, composed by George Zippel. She, I guess she stood up and said, that's my uncle! <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, you know, how cool is that? Yeah, you know? right, 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 right. Um, yeah, so, so and... It, now, you said you said you were sitting down, you sat down, you are watching the video, and you sat down, you kind of just, like, regurgitated... Vomited. Vomited music. Now, would that be, like, the same as, like, a jam session if a band gets there and they just do a jam session, and then out of that jam session, things yeah, well, are well, created? What's nice is that, is that as you roll the video, and then I have, you know, have it recording, and I, and I just kind of, like, mm, 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 you know, play something... I can go back and go, you know, I really like this. This sucks. Uh, but I like this. Well, these two go together. And then you can actually take pieces. You Frankenstein parts, that whole thing Frankenstein together. Frankenstein yeah, it together right, yeah. uh, as you jam. Right. You know, and then, okay, it needs an overdub here. It needs, uh, okay, that's full. <laughs> Let's go to the next part, you know. Um, so that was pretty cool. Um, I... You know, I, I, it's funny, I, I, now some of the jobs, that are, uh, the corporate work, you, you asked me about what that's all about, you know. Um, 
at the Natural History Museum, there is a kiosk called Ohio Rocks, okay? And it's about geology. And it's got all these uh, different periods of rock formation with rock songs. Oh. And like Billy Sullivan sings a couple of them. Um, uh, Lynn Gerald sings a couple of them. I even have... Um, so they use a lot of local people for that, basically. Col- Coleman Wallace. Do you know who he is? Coleman Wallace is this harmonica player, blues harmonica player in Cleveland, who's a monster. If you ever get a chance to see him, he's wonderful. And I saw him, and I was thinking, uh, it was uh, it, it was the Mississippian period, and I guess that period was a lot of mud, and you know. So I, I came up with the concept of writing Mississippi mud pies, okay, and so it was going to be like a backwoods, you know, folky, bluesy, you know, New Orleans maybe kind of thing, and I, I, Coleman was just like, oh man, he's got a voice for that, you know. I I I I'm scared to go. I'm going, Mr. 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 Wallace, would you be interested in work? Heck yeah! Yeah, <laughs> <He was laughs> right. like, I'm in. This sounds like fun. And he did. Oh, he then then the video. We had to do a video for the thing. I said he'd be perfect for the video. Man, he's I'm I'm there. I'm there. That's great. Yeah, I mean, and some of these people are so cooperative and really, you know. Do you find uh, that? Do you find that people just want to be asked, and and that's like like that, like when you go up to somebody, you need you're asking, you need somebody to do something, you want somebody to do something in your your thing that you're involved in, and you're like, oh, I don't know how to do this, and then you just go ask somebody, and they go, yeah, and most and you're most, like, pe- <laughs> most people are so uh, yeah, you know, so happy to do something like that. Um, I, I mean, when NASA had the had the thing, a lot of those kiosks, uh, I did the sound effects for, and the and the and the narration and whatever. Um, I finished a project a few years back um, where it was the story of the Battle of Midway, okay? And what it was is the kiosks and everything were going to be put on the deck of the USS Midway, which is docked in wow. San Diego, okay? And so on the second floor underneath the, the main, you know, I don't know if they call them floors. I doubt it. But anyway... <laughs> On the, on the second floor, they have this, like, museum. And there's all these kiosks. And at one point, they wanted to do this. You went into this movie theater. Well, as you walked into this movie theater, you get into this area where there's bombs blowing off and people on the boat screaming, you know, and stuff like that. And they said, well, we want to do this in four-channel, discreet four-channel. How do I do that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah we'll yes, do it. Yes, I'll do it. <laughs> and so, I mean, it was really funny. Like, one of the channels was, you know, the, the, the announcer and the saying, oh, get out of here. And well, and then the, the one was, like, stereo bombs. And then I had, like, a flame coming up in one of the... So they weren't four channels square. They were positioned where they should be. Oh, know? so the sound was coming out of, out of this area. That area, where, yeah, Wow. Right. And so it was strange Then uh, the people involved in the project, and I'm talking like admirals and things like that, well, we'd like to hear the audio before we install it. Well, that would mean them coming over my house. (laughs) And that would mean me having to set up a four-channel setup in my house. And I actually set it up kind of how it was supposed to be. One of the speakers you thought would go? Yeah. And um, they loved it. They said, yeah, that's, I mean, you know. Uh, the hardest part about that particular project was there were a lot of Japanese planes and a lot of American planes, World War II planes. They sound different. They sound different. Wow. And there's going to be some guy who's going to go, you know, <laughs> I flew one of them during the war, and man, it don't sound like that. Um, so I really had to research, wow, or research, depending on how you like to say it, Um what that plane sounds like, you know, and then have it fit the video. Cause we had plane video, but we didn't have music or sound effect to fit that. And if the plane's going, you know, then I had to find that plane going, you know what I mean? Exactly. So that was the hard, I mean, I did a lot of search, a lot of search, you know, homework just to create the sound effects. But, wow. uh, I didn't have one guy go, no, you didn't do that right, you know. Everyone liked it when it was done. Thank God. And then they had this big party. (sighs) 
never been to a party like that before. On the on the here you are on this aircraft carrier. You were on an aircraft carrier? Well, that's with well, the Midway's aircraft carrier. Oh, that's where this I museum is. No kidding. Oh yeah, the second f- f- floor of the museum and aircraft carriers. I don't know if you've ever been out there. Big. No, never. And this party was on tables of like food. I mean, oh. just piled. Okay, here's the shrimp table. There's the lobster table. There's the prime rib table. There's the there, there's the wine table, which I, I ended up laying on. <laughs> um, but uh, it, uh, it it was like oh, it was such a great party, and very few times they flew me out there. No kidding. To San and, Diego, and, and gave me a room, and so what I did was I paid for Jan to come. We made a little vacation out of it. But it was really cool. Nobody does that. I thought that what a great organization. Hell yeah! Nobody does that. When they when you get uh, presented with these these type of jobs, when you when they come to you and you're you're, you're kind of like hearing their their pitch, what they're looking for, is is that what it is? Do they give you a, a, a really defined idea that you have to recreate, or do they say, "Here's the minimum stuff that we're going to give you. Now you create and." come back with something and we'll let you know if we like it. Does that make sense what I did it? Okay. Yeah, and I'm trying I'm trying to figure out how to be tactful about it. <laughs> how I answer I got that. you. In most in many situations people haven't a clue what they want. And so it's kind of my job to give them a clue, you know. Um which I don't I don't mind doing. But then you get everybody on board who you're working with, you know, your, 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 your producer, you know, the, the group that's hiring you because there's steps. There's the media company that hires me and then the media company's hired by the corporate client, you know. Um, and so I get, we, we're, we're together and we're like, oh yeah, this is great. And we put this thing together and we play it for the corporate client and they go, I don't think so. And it's like, yeah. What is it you want? Well, I want it to be more orange. So, so at this What's point, orange? So you, you know? give them a starting point sometimes is what this turns into. And You're, many times. And then times. It, from there it goes, yeah, I got you. Many times it's changed, you know, in some form or another. Um, which is, you just get used to it after a while. You have to, you have to be... Um, Open-minded about I, going in there yeah. with your thing. Well, it, it, it's, it's like... It's like well, you you mentioned that I do photography, and my wife does amazing work with photography, and we do sell our stuff. We have it uh, at a at a little place in in Berea um, called Per Cup, and it's a breakfast lunch, and they they let us. We we got like three or four walls of stuff hanging. Oh, there. all your stuff's in there. Yeah, oh, and, that's great. Uh, and, and so my wife experiments because she she's gotten so far into Photoshop that, you know, I, 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 she scares me. Okay. (laughs) And this winter she did this wonderful thing that looked like ink, black ink on white. And then she'd put a cardinal. So there'd be a picture of like a, a red farmhouse and then everything else would be black and white snow. And then somewhere she'd stick a red cardinal, you know, or there, there, there'd be a bridge, black and white bridge. And then, you know, and it was looked like pen and ink drawings, but it was a Photoshop, photography, yeah. you know, photography. And it really was very cool. And we were sitting there eating one day by the photos. And this guy walks up and goes, my seven-year-old daughter could do that. And... I, I chuckled because I'm thinking, you idiot, you know. You don't even know who you're talking to. <laughs> and then Jan was like, and I felt so bad because she, she was a school teacher. So for her to get involved in the arts and be turned down and be told that you suck and, uh, you know, these all these things that, gee, we're so accustomed to. Yeah, right. You know, yeah, just, got used I, it's to. just have to get used to that, you know. Um so, uh, you know, she's having a difficult time with that. Whereas, like I said, I mean. You want to please everybody. Some people just think they have to, everyone has to like it. You're just, for everybody that likes you, there's a number of people that are going to have some kind of like negative. Well, so many people find it necessary to make an opinion when it's, when they have no 
stand, no leg to stand on. Right. Where they ha- they don't really know anything about what you do. You know, you know, it's like it's like when you when we're playing out and somebody comes up and go, someone comes up and goes, "Hey, can you play?" <laughs> and we go, "Well, no, we're, I'm sorry, we don't do that." Well, you guys suck. <laughs> And then they walk away, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and I mean, that happens, I know, you know, yep. and, and you just, you just kind of, um, okay. You know, uh, I had a real bad internet situation happen to me. Uh, I was on one of those rock and roll musician internet groups. Okay. And I had mentioned that I was playing a club and this guy came up and he said, he said, excuse me, he says, he was very nice. He says, excuse me, he says, I bought a keyboard about two months ago. And so I've been really kind of working with it. He said, but I'm just not getting anywhere. I said, in two months? He said, yeah. Now, my thought process was, oh, my God, buddy, you know, you've got a ways to go. I said, you know, I've been doing this 60 years. I'm still learning. But this is what I'm thinking. My response to him was, you know, I've been doing this a long time, and I I still don't think I have it together. I said, be patient, you know. And that's was my comment. And I wrote this on this web (gasps) page. It was like, (laughs) get all the guys that are going to come and rip your face off because they're not understanding. They're thinking that I'm being mean and cruel and nasty. Yeah, it's the context of things gets lost in words sometimes. And and I'm I'm writing, no, no, you don't understand. I didn't say anything nasty to this guy. I said, I want him to, you know, I, I, I want him to understand that this takes a while, you know, and, and, and musicians, guitar players, they don't just pick up the guitar and go, Oh, I'm going to play. No, that doesn't happen. Every you know? great guitar player we've ever had on here. They're really great ones. They're, they're obsessed with practicing. Oh yeah. You have obsessed. To. And, and I felt so bad. And then what happened was friends of mine, God bless them, tried to come, you know, uh, the cavalry came in and they said, and they, all the, all these people were saying, I never met you. I never want to meet you. You are the biggest bastard in the world. And I mean, they were insulting me up one time. They've already figured out who you are based on this one little thing. You know, know everything about you. You kind soccer and about, you know, the whole thing. And and I was like really upset. And then, you know, my friends came in and they started, well, then they started attacking my friends. How can you have a friend like this guy? You're associated with that guy. And I, I just, what? I just took the whole thing off. That was I said, it. I, I, you're not going to, you can attack me, but don't attack my friends, you know, yeah, and right. especially. Gets out of control. It does get out of control. Yep. So when you get all the comments uh, about this video. <laughs> <laughs> How could you have him on your show? I don't want to hear him, okay? <laughs> I just don't want to hear him. Uh, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. All right. So what is it? we're, we're going to, I want to just go over a couple with, with some of the people. Let them know. Those guys. Mm-hmm. You guys will be playing out all summer. Playing all summer, we're doing a lot of deck jobs. Um, most outside of, a lot, you do a lot of outside, outside yeah, gigs. you know, like teams and and and, and Tony K's and oh gosh, Mar- um, uh, uh, out Marblehead, Mar- Marblehead Galley, beautiful little place out there. Um, and uh, um, oh, oh, Depot, uh, Bria Depot, oh, yeah, which yeah. has got a real nice patio out there. Um, uh, and then we're doing Gino's uh, is happening, uh, the, the new uh, Italian place, um, uh, Blue Heron, uh, you know. I yeah, mean. everyone, just look. And like I said, you know, like I'll, like I said, I'll post that one thing up that that one guy's been putting out there because I think that's brilliant that he's he's got all the everyone playing out and where they're at, and you could always find out where everyone's playing out. But thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate it. This has been a blast. We probably could talk for a lot longer, but. We only we only have so much time, <laughs> but we have. But, but we, maybe we'll have you we back on. Yeah, we can always do part two, and maybe we'll have Ed come yeah. on with you next time or something, and we'll have both you guys those, together. Those guys part two, yeah, yeah, that'd be cool, man. <laughs> I would, I'd love it. Check them out, man. Go look, see those guys. That's what you know. Like, there's always something to do here in Cleveland. Always something to do on Saturday night, Friday night. Check these guys out. They'll be near you guys, uh, especially West Side, mostly, right? Mm. Hopefully less like. All right, that's it from us. We'll see you guys next week. Peace out. That'll be fine.